I, I definitely feel that um, you can do this play. You can certainly do this, like a version of this play where Prospero decides to save the guys at the beginning. He's already made the decision, you know, that, that, um, that he's going to do that. He's fine. He feels fine about it. And that the rest of the play is sort of a series of resolutions. And, and it's, uh, that, those, those productions tend to be a little bit more light in tone, a little more comic in tone. I mean, I, I think there's real comedy in play real belly laughs and, and charm in the, in the Ferdinand Miranda relationship and how they fall in love. And, but I also think that real forgiveness is a very difficult thing to achieve. When you think about how Prospero has been violated, you know, the, his brother betrayed him. They shipped him out on a boat with his daughter with K rations, and his best friend Gonzalo threw him some magic books so that he could survive. And he was left to die at sea. He doesn't. But you imagine going to an island, showing up there, and for 12 years thinking about that. Thinking about that, and thinking about the day that's going to arrive when you get to enact retribution. That's not all fun and games. The major plots of the, all three major plots of the play revolve around revenge. And it's Caliban's revenge, it's um, uh, Sebastian's revenge, and it's Prospero's revenge. You know, and it's Miranda who is Prospero's touchstone to his vulnerability, his capacity to forgive, enables him to really experience goodness. Human goodness. And she's the, she's, she's the evidence that human goodness is possible and worth celebrating. And that's his deepest relationship in the play. That's why it's so hard for him to let her go. The last person he lets go of is Miranda. The last one. Now, that's no accident. In my production, I'm very interested in how... Caliban and Ariel feed into that. I mean, Carolyn, Caliban and Ariel are obviously, you know, aspects, projected aspects of Prospero's being. I mean, in, on, 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 they're also separate characters. They're sentient beings. They have their own modus operandi. They have their own psychology. But their psychologies are inherently wedded to this guy. They don't go anywhere without him. They don't do anything without him. They're, they're in reactive response to him entirely. And he's, he lords over them. He lords over them in a way that doesn't feel... Um, you can't really explain that without understanding that they're aspects of who he is. So it's very important to me that the, his release of them, his release of Caliban, and his release of Ariel are titanic elements in, in, in the show that you feel these are major events where he's letting go of controlling aspects of part of himself to join the community of people who he has inherited for better or worse and to move through life with some kind of enlightened relationship. The word strange is used the most in The Tempest of any of other his plays. I mean, it, it's used a lot. I think it appears, I think Barry said 72 times or something, you know, and and so there's this idea I wanted to capture. I want to capture this, this sensation that when you're watching, you're never divorced from the idea of this is, this is an odd thing. It's an odd event. It's not normal. And so I've got a number of different strategies to do that. I've got a team of dancers in the show that are going to be creating a lot of the magic, a lot of the human magic, and I want the magic to be extraordinary and, and, and visibly, um, you know, seen as created by people, not s splashy effects with lights and, and that, you know, those kind, kinds of things. There, there will be great lights and all that stuff, but it'll be there to enhance these, what these dancers are doing and how they're facilitating Prospero's world. I've got um, the, the, the music in the show is sort of inspired a little bit by Middle Eastern chanting and, uh, you know, Haitian dance. <laughs> um, there's, what I'm trying to get at is some 
feeling of beauty and exoticism and strangeness and kind of, you know, um, uh, hypnotic engagement. You know, you're like, wow, what, what, what's, what's that? And I don't want it to be like alienating, like, oh God, that's just, but I want it to be something that where you're, you're swept up in something a little bit, a little bit unknown and a little bit odd but that really is captivating and you feel like enthralled by it. I'm setting the play in the Renaissance um, for lots of reasons, but I feel like the Renaissance is a period of time where, where we um, are not familiar um, in terms of what actually happened then, although we have some vocabulary that helps us understand it. The, the clothes that people wore then, the, the way they spoke with each other, and the fact that the Renaissance is the last period in human history where all, all knowledge could be hypothetically um, digested by one single person, and that person being, um, in, in our case, Prospero, uh, that all feels like compelling reasons to, to sort of put it there. Um, Shakespeare works in metaphor already, so we already have a working metaphor going. Having said that, while the guys from Naples who show up are all going to be in Renaissance clothes, you know, this island is a land of strangeness. And there's Caliban, you know, who's this neo-pagan inhabitant of this island. And, and what does he look like? And, and, um, and there's obviously like a, a, a colonial implication in, in how Prospero treats Caliban. And, but I feel like I want that to be timeless. In other words, people have been, been invading each other for throughout history. So rather than set it in the, you know, in the Boer War, I'd rather have it live in the context of this, of this, of this island where the relationships kind of tell us, kind of reveal the politics of the, of the, of the play.